The father reached his hand into the heavens and pulled down seven stars, and one by one he set them on the brow of Huger of the Hill to make a glowing crown. The maid brought him forth a girl as supple as willow, with eyes like deep pools, and Hugo declared that he would have her for his bride. So the mother made her fertile, and the crone foretold that she would bear the king four and forty mighty sons. The warrior gave strength to their arms, whilst the smith wrought for each a suit of iron plates. But sadly, the gods no longer walk the earth among us, and you can see what a mess we've made of their creation since. Yet we have hope. The gods didn't abandon us in silence, but gave us their holy words to guide us, collected in the oldest and holiest text of the faith of the seven, the seven-pointed star. Divided into seven books for the seven aspects of God, in it we learn of the Father's justice, the Mother's mercy, the Maiden's innocence, the Crone's wisdom, the Warrior's strength, the Smith's labor, and the Stranger's peace. It is a long book. Many never read it in its entirety, even if they could. When the Andals first sailed for Westeros, filled with divine fire, every warrior carved a seven-pointed star into his body, for even that was easier than carving its namesake into his mind. Though one could perhaps argue that it wasn't the warriors, but the septons and scepters, armed with the holy text of the seven-pointed star, who truly conquered Westeros. The first men had no letters, but the runes they would scratch onto rocks. No gods, but the faces they would carve into trees. But then came our holy men and women among them, bearing the very words of the gods under their arms. Trees and rocks were no match for the seven-pointed star, and most of Westeros soon turned to the faith and to its guardians, their new Andal overlords. Whilst the Andals soon fractured into warring kingdoms, the faith remained whole and indivisible, bound together by the seven-pointed star. When those kingdoms fell to Aegon and his dragons thousands of years later, the faith remained subject only to the seven above and the seven-pointed star below. Or so it was supposed to be. Too often, our high septons have lost their way clouded by worldly wealth and power. No matter, we still have the seven-pointed star. Men's will and virtue may fail, but the words never do. As men bow to their lords and lords to their kings, so kings and queens must bow before the seven who are one. The knees of the powerful work the same as the knees of the weak and were given to all for the same purpose to bend before the gods, or break in the bending. Today, men know the seven as statues in the septs, but in the old days, the gods themselves walked among men. They crowned Hugo of the Hill, the first king of the Andal people, and promised him that his descendants would rule great kingdoms in a foreign continent. When the time came, the Andals carved the seven-pointed star upon their bodies and set sail for the strange land across the narrow sea, Westeros. Whilst Andal warriors battled the first men for kingdoms, Andal septons battled for souls and were received just as courteously. We don't know how many bold and pious men lost their lives, but adversity bred strength. Our purest and most righteous believers took up the sword to defend and preserve the faith from its enemies. So was born the Order of the Faith Militant. When Aegon the Conqueror landed in Westeros, the High Septon locked himself in a sept for seven days and seven nights. Finally, the Crone lifted her golden lamp and showed him the path ahead. The High Septon himself would anoint and crown Aegon as Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, and the Faith Militant rallied behind Aegon in governing his newly united land. Yet Aegon and his sisters never wholly accepted the Faith. The High Septon had conceded Aegon's marriages to his sisters, 
as a relic of his Valerian heritage, which would soon fade. But when Aegon's heir wed his daughter to his son, the faith could brook such abomination no longer. The High Septon led the denunciation of the Targaryens, and all over Westeros the Faith Militant took up their swords against the dynasty and its supporters. The Faith Militant set upon and punished the Septon who had performed the ceremony. A few of the Faith Militant's more militant members even scaled the walls of the castle and would have slain the king and his family had a knight of the King's Guard not intervened. Frightened, the king fled to Dragonstone, where he soon died of cramps. And so ascended the king's younger brother, Magor the Cruel. His first act was to challenge the faith militant to kill him if they believed his rule to be ungodly. To the Order's eternal credit, they accepted. Sir Damon Morrigan proposed a trial by seven. Sir Damon and six of the faith militant against the king and his six champions. It was a contest in which the kingdom itself was at stake, and the accounts and tales are many. But at the end of it, Magor alone lived, proving that the throne was rightfully his. He mounted the black dragon, Valerian, and burnt down the sept in King's Landing, while the faith militant were inside at morning prayers. The screams of the burning and dying men were said to echo throughout the city. Though Mega had won the trial by seven, he demanded the complete destruction of the faith militant and the faith itself, if necessary. He made war upon the order wherever he found it. Yet the faith militant would not surrender, raising armies of their own and turning Mega's own lords against him. The father's justice may not always be swift, but it is certain. One morning, Mega was found dead on the Iron Throne. No one knows how. Magor's cruelty died with him. His successor saw the wisdom of a united crown and faith, and his hand reached an accord with the High Septon. As long as the Iron Throne defended the faith, the faith would put aside its own swords and its condemnation of the Targaryens. Perhaps the High Septon felt he had no course but compromise. Outlawed and hunted for years, the Faith Militant was but a shadow of its former self. Without its own guardians, the Faith would have to rely on corrupt worldly kings and their corrupt worldly courts. For thousands of years, the Faith Militant had stood watch over the Faith. And then, its son set. Now, after years of war and destruction, of abomination and blasphemy, None can argue that we have been walking through darkness. Perhaps the time has come when the sun must rise again. Who are the faceless men? It depends on who is asking. To a penitent, they may be relief. To a victim, they may be vengeance. To a lord, they may be an incredible expense, and to the Iron Bank, they may be just another asset. Nobody but the faceless men know their origin, though the order is rumored to predate the founding of Bravos. We know only that they reside in, or are somehow aligned with, the House of Black and White, an odd and lonely building where few who enter ever leave. Some whisper that those werewood doors open not on a house, but onto the world of the dead, from whence the faceless men rise when summoned. We can dismiss such foolishness as we do the fishwives who spread it. The House of Black and White is merely a temple, consecrated to the many-faced god, and filled with statuary of his many faces. The old gods of Westeros, the Lord of Light, the Black Goat, the Lion of Night, the Weeping Lady, a stranger. Perhaps now you understand what is worshipped here, and along with them, other gods whom none alive now recognize, brought here long ago by sailors who never came again. Unlike the priests of other religions, the servants here preach no sermons 
and perform no ceremonies. As far as one can see, silence and solitude form the whole of their worship, as well as collecting the occasional devotee. If one wants to engage a faceless man, one visits the house of black and white and pays the price. As for what that may be, those who have paid it rarely speak of it. For make no mistake, from the moment the faceless man accepts your offer, the man you named is dead, though he doesn't know it. Perhaps not that day, perhaps not that year, but soon and inevitably. Many would say you are as much his murderer as if you'd swung the axe yourself. Just as many would say, that's the point. A young man walks beside a girl across a flowered field. Spring has come, and this girl is his life. He prays. A child climbs a tree to watch the sunset over the fields. Summer is ending, and the harvest is life for his village. He prays. A hunter tracks a boar through the woods. Winter is coming, and this boar is life for his family. He prays. But to whom do they pray? The world has as many answers as there are men to answer. But walk far enough, climb high enough, hunt long enough, and a man shall find only one. One God, with many faces. In the faith of the seven, he is the stranger who guides men from this life to the next. Few seek his favor, or at least, few realize that they do. In the north of Westeros, he is one of the nameless old gods staring out from the weirwood trees and the snow. In the Iron Islands, he is the drowned god, calling men down to his watery hall. What is dead may never die, but rises again harder and stronger. In the Far East, he is the Lion of Night, who fathered the world's first emperor on the Maiden Made of Light, and whose wrath nearly ended the world. In Volantis, he is the Lord of Light, whose followers feed men to the flames to beg his favor. In Lys, he is the Weeping Lady, who sheds her tears for the living, soon to die. In Kohor, he is the Black Goat, and he feeds on blood offerings every day. On holy days, he is offered condemned criminals, and in times of great crisis, he may even be offered the noblest children of the city to beg his protection. Does he accept their gift? Well, the city still stands. For the poor, he is the hooded wayfarer. For soldiers, he is Bacalon, the pale child. For sailors, he is the moon pale maiden and the Merlin king. In the house of black and white, however, he is all of them and none of them. He is the many-faced God, and wherever a man turns, there he is. Men come from every corner of the world to know him, to beg his favor and seek his gift. For themselves, if their life has grown too hard, or for others who are making it so, it is all the same to the many-faced God. While I do Hyrus, all men must serve him, beggars and kings. While I Morgulis, all men must die good and evil. Men worship as they will, but at the end of every road stands the many-faced God, waiting. Valeria was young, and as the young do, it sought to spread its seed. Its first daughter was Volantis, an outpost on the mighty Rhoyne River at the frontier of the Empire. There, the Dragon Lords raised the famous Black Walls, seamless fused dragonstone 200 feet tall, and so thick that six four-horse chariots can race along the battlements side by side, as they do each year to celebrate the founding of the city. To this day, only those who can trace their ancestry back to old Valyria are allowed to dwell within the Black Walls. None are even permitted to set foot inside without an express invitation of a scion of the old blood meaning, of course, the ancient and noble blood of foot soldiers. For the city's first hundred years, its only inhabitants were its garrison. But where soldiers go, vice follows. Taverns and brothels began to sprout up outside the Black Walls, and merchant ships began to call as well, bearing the favored trade of the summer sea, slaves. The East Bank filled with homes, shops, and society, 
And so the taverns and brothels moved to the West Bank, where foreigners, sellswords, and pirates erected their own shadow city of fornication, drunkenness, and murder. In time, the West Bank became such a cesspit of crime and depravity that the Volunteens had no choice but to send their slave soldiers across the Rhoyne to restore order and some semblance of decency. Like all such missions, they succeeded, they left, then they failed. When the Volunteens grew weary of shipping their soldiers across the Rhoyne every year, they built the famous Long Bridge of Volantis, strong enough to support the weight of a thousand elephants and many more soldiers. The Long Bridge of Volantis stands today as the longest bridge in all the known world. The Volantine rulers intended the bridge to spread the civilization of the East Bank to the West. Instead, the depravity of the West Bank spread east. Shops, temples, taverns, inns and brothels line the bridge, most three or four stories tall, with each floor overhanging the one beneath it. One can buy anything on the Long Bridge, or steal it if one's hands are quick enough. But if they're not... Though at least half the decor committed no greater crime than displeasing a master, for in Volantis there are five slaves for every free man, a proportion matched only by the cities of Slaver's Bay. The volunteer masters mark their property with facial tattoos, permanent and scarring, which denote the vocation of the slave. Slave soldiers wear green tiger stripes upon their faces. Slave whores are marked by tears beneath one eye. The slaves that collect the dung of horses and elephants are marked with flies. The drivers of the hathes, the carts pulled by the small elephants of lanterns, are marked with wheels, and so on. A master may give his slave freedom, but no man can give a new face. Is it any wonder, then, that the slaves and freed men have turned in such great numbers to the priests who preach of a cleansing fire? The Temple of the Lord of Light in Volantis is said to be the greatest in all the world, larger even than the great sept of Baelor. All who serve within this mighty temple are slaves, bought as children and trained to become priests, temple prostitutes, or warriors. And one could argue its adherents outside the temple are slaves as well, in mind if not in body. Magic frees nobody except its practitioner to do what he will with those who can't just as the black walls free the old blood to see what they will, without those they don't. But one must wonder how much longer such freedoms will endure, when across Essos, one hears the sound of chains breaking, of slaves rising, of dragons roaring. Volantis may call itself the first daughter of Valyria, but it is not the last. Most cities are built on stone. Bravos was built on ships, or more specifically, their cargo. Slaves who rose up against their Valyrian captors and seized the helms of the convoy. Of all crimes, Valyria punished rebellion most severely. The slaves faced not execution, but the Valyrian mines or labor camps in the most remote and savage colonies if recaptured. And few corners of the world can long remain hidden from Dragonback. However, our histories claim that a group of slave women prophesied the slaves would find shelter in a distant lagoon behind a wall of pine-clad hills and sea stones, where the frequent fogs would help hide the refugees from the eyes of dragon riders passing overhead. And so it proved. Because they had risked their lives in the name of freedom, the mothers and fathers of the new city vowed that no man, woman or child in Bravos should ever be a slave. This is the first law of Bravos engraved in stone on the arch that spans the Long Canal. For over a hundred years, Bravos hid itself from the eyes of the world, who called it the Secret City. Using a dye derived from a local snail, our captains stained their sails purple to hide their stolen Valyrian ships. Our merchants carried false charts and lied when questioned about their home port. Eventually, one sea lord, our elected ruler, decided enough time had passed and initiated the unmasking of Bravos to the world and to Valyria. Of course, it helped that the Iron Bank made handsome restitution to the Dragon Lords for the stolen ships, whilst, of course, refusing to pay for the value of the slaves themselves. 
The anniversary of the unmasking is celebrated every year in Bravos with 10 days of feasting and masked revelry, a festival like none other in the known world, culminating at midnight on the 10th day when the Titan roars and tens of thousands of celebrants remove their masks as one. Freed of the constraints of secrecy, Bravos quickly grew into the wealthiest and most powerful of the free cities, and, one could argue, the most beautiful. From the sprawling Sea Lord's Palace with its menagerie of strange beasts and birds, to the imposing Palace of Justice and the aqueduct we call the Sweetwater River that bears fresh water from the mainland, Bravos is without rival in either engineering or elegance. The temples of Bravos are also famed throughout the world and wondrous to behold. Descended from a hundred different peoples, the Bravosi honor a hundred different gods. The Temple of the Moon Singers is the foremost of these, being the faith of the slave women whose prophecies led our ancestors here. The Lord of Light has a great temple as well, for his worshippers have grown ever more numerous in the past hundred years. Yet less numerous, and even some forgotten faiths still have temples deep in the heart of the city, on the Isle of the Gods. But the beauty of Bravos is not only in her buildings. Bravosi's swordsmanship is renowned throughout the world. Ah, Bravos eschew the armor and long swords of the Westerosi knights, preferring speed, agility, and slender blades. The greatest Bravos call themselves water dancers, after the custom of dueling upon the moon pool near the Sea Lord's Palace. By tradition, the greatest of all the Bravos is the First Sword, who commands the personal guard of the Sea Lord and protects his person at all public events. Once chosen, Sea Lords serve for life. Inevitably, there are always those who wish to cut that life short to effect some change in policy. Though not even the First Swords are the true guardians of Bravos. That honor goes to the Titan, who protects the entrance to the harbor. With his proud head and fiery eyes looming close to 400 feet above the sea, the Titan is a fortress of a kind never seen before or since. His eyes are huge beacon fires, lighting the way for returning ships into the lagoon. Within his bronze body are halls and chambers, murder holes and arrow slits. Enemy ships can be steered onto the rocks by the watchmen inside the Titan, and stones and pots of burning pitch can be dropped onto the decks of any that attempt to pass between the Titan's legs without leave. This has seldom been necessary, however. Not since the century of blood has any enemy been so rash as to attempt to provoke the Titan's wrath. Should an enemy break through into the lagoon, however, he would face the walls of Bravos, again, not of stone like other cities, but of ships. The arsenal of Bravos can build one of our famous purple-hulled war galleys in a single day. All the vessels are constructed following the same design, so that all the many parts can be prepared in advance, and skilled shipbuilders work upon different sections of the vessel simultaneously to hasten the labor. To organize such a feat of engineering is unprecedented. One need only look at the raucous, confused construction in the shipyards around the world to see the truth of this. Let us imagine that even the arsenal, great as it is, failed us. An enemy who could defeat both the Titan and our fleet would be strong indeed. But Bravos does not depend only on statues and ships. We also have iron and gold. Each brother of the Night's Watch swears a sacred oath to protect the realms of men. That doesn't mean pissing about, waiting for the cold to finally put an end to you. It means bleeding. It means fighting. It means going beyond the wall and hunting down those who mean harm to the realm. So how do you get a thousand rapists and thieves to fight together, to bleed together? That's the burden of the Lord Commander. He keeps the builders building, the rangers ranging and the stewards stewarding or else it all falls apart. Each Lord Commander is chosen from and by his fellow brothers, and he serves for life. A long time ago, you may have had men from Queensgate and Long Barrow and the other 16 castles of the wall come to Castle Black for an election. These days, you'd be lucky to scrape a few dozen from Eastwatch and the Shadow Tower or however many they can spare who cast votes in their stead. 
All the same, the brothers are allowed to name whomever they think worthy of the title. Then we vote until one man receives a majority, however long it takes. Some elections have lasted less than an hour, some have lasted weeks, one even lasted two years. Maester Eamon has said there have been 997 Lord Commanders since the Night's Watch was founded. Back then we had true soldiers, men of honour and strength. Now look who mans the wall. Bastards, peasants who stole a sheep to bugger, and fat little nobles who weren't worthy of their Lord Father's land. But the Lord Commander must find a place for them all, and turn these walking piles of horse dung into soldiers of the Night's Watch. Though we haven't always been so lucky to have such men to lead us, we've had cowards and fools as well. Our tyrants and our madmen. Runcel Hightower tried to bequeath the watch to his bastard. Roderick Flint thought to make himself king beyond the wall. Tristan Mudd, Mad Mark Rankenfell, Robin Hill, each nearly destroyed us with their foolishness. Six hundred years ago, the commanders at Snowgate and the Night Fort even went to war against each other. The simpering Lord Commander asked them politely to lay aside their quarrel. And incredibly they did, because they joined forces to murder him. The Stark and Winterfell had to intervene and take both their heads to save the Night's Watch. Now we've got more mouths than we can feed. A southern king in our castle, and cells full of wildlings, and no Lord Commander, since the last was betrayed by his own men. We need a new leader. A man respected enough to hold the Watch together in this dark hour. A leader strong enough to make sure that the Night's Watch survives the coming winter, no matter the cost. Brandon the Builder, founder of House Stark, raised Winterfell with giants over 8,000 years ago. Or so nursemaids tell all the children of the North. The children nod wide-eyed, unaware of the lesson forced on them, that if even giants obeyed a Stark, so too should they. But like every other castle, Winterfell was built in pieces over thousands of years. The first men settled there because of the hot springs that bubbled through the ground. The water and the heat helped them survive the northern winters, and they built defenses to keep it for themselves. Nobody raised the castle all at once. Probably nobody meant to raise a castle at all. In those days, the Starks were not the greatest house in the north, and Winterfell was not the greatest castle. Barrowton was the oldest, dating to the first king, and the Starks fought the Barrow kings for a thousand years. Greywater Watch was, like the Cranach men themselves, the strangest. Only marriage subdued its marsh kings. But the greatest rival to Winterfell was always the Dreadfort, and my ancestors, the Red Kings of House Bolton. If tales can be believed, we fought from the long night until the Andals came. Because of us, Winterfell raised its first walls. When we took and burnt the castle anyway, Winterfell built more keeps, more walls, more guard towers. They expanded the granaries and larders to survive our sieges. They tended the gods' wood to win favor with the old gods against us. As the castle grew, more farmers and villagers flocked every winter from across the north to huddle under its walls raising the winter town. In the spring, these villagers would find themselves marching in the Stark armies to fight against us. The greatness of Winterfell is as much our doing as the Starks. But in the end, neither its stone walls nor its tall keeps and iron gates could save Winterfell. At its height, it could have lasted a year under heavy siege, but a handful of ironborn seized it in the night, while its lord, the king in the north, was playing in the south. My dagger ended his reign. And now House Bolton holds the castle of our ancient enemies. The direwolf no longer flies from the battlements above me, nor guards the doors and cornices of Winterfell against me. Below me, miles of long-dead Starks fade into darkness and obscurity, until even their faces are lost. Some northerners whisper that they wait for the day their house will rise again. They will wait forever. Barrison the Bold, they call me to my face. I know what they say behind my back. Barristan the Old. And it's true. 
I am old, with hair as white as all the winters I've seen. The older a man grows, the less sleep he needs. These days I barely sleep at all. When darkness falls over this strange city, I find myself visited by the faces of the kings I have served, the faces of those I swore to protect, the faces of those I failed. All I ever wanted was to live a life of honor, defending a king worthy of service. During the War of the Ninepenny Kings, I sought out Malus the Monstrous, last of the Blackfire Pretenders who had started this whole war. Malus believed that his Targaryen blood gave him a claim to the Iron Throne. I made sure his blood claimed nothing more than the dirt around his corpse. To show his gratitude, the king elevated me to his king's guard. It was the proudest moment of my life. But that king died, and I wasn't with him. Not that I could have saved him if I had been, but still, I vowed to do better with his son, the young Prince Ares. For twenty years, his reign was peaceful and prosperous. Ares was well loved by his subjects and respected by his lords. But as years went on, Ares' temper soured. He became obsessed with dragons and fire, and the swords of the king's guard couldn't defend him from the enemies he saw lurking in every shadow. My king went mad. But there was hope. His son and heir. Prince Rhaegar was everything a kingdom could hope for in a ruler. He was strong but gentle, wise and cautious, and a good friend. No matter the wounds Ares dug into the realm, we had faith that his son would sew it back together again when he ascended the throne. Then came Lord Wentz Tourney at Harrenhal, the largest ever in Westeros. I unhorsed every man against me until only Prince Rhaegar remained. We each set our feet in our saddles and lowered our lances and charged. And I fell. Muddy and bruised, I then watched Rhaegar present Lyanna Stark with the victor's crown of roses though she was betrothed to Robert Baratheon, and Rhaegar himself was married to Elia Martell. We all know what happened after. If I'd been a bit quicker with my lance, if I'd chosen a faster horse, perhaps I could have spared the kingdom from the destruction that came after. Or if I'd thought to warn Brandon Stark against his rashness, he came to King's Landing himself, demanding Rhaegar return his sister. Poor fool. If he'd only known the depth of Aerys' madness, he wouldn't have dared provoke him. Ares ordered Brandon imprisoned, and I could do nothing but obey. When Brandon's father, Lord Rickard Stark, came to King's Landing to beg for his son, Ares burned him alive, and I could do nothing but watch. I had sworn a vow to a mad king, and was honor-bound to obey him, even at the cost of my soul. Ravens soon arrived with dark news for the king, the veil was in open revolt. Demanding Lyanna Stark's return, Robert Baratheon was smashing any army that dared face him. Eddard Stark, Brandon's younger brother, was marching the whole of the north down the neck and had taken Catelyn Tully, Brandon's betrothed, for his own, thus winning the support of the Riverlands. The king sent ravens to Casterly Rock to beg his former hand, Tywin Lannister, for help. And no ravens returned. A plan was devised. Prince Rhaegar would personally lead the royal forces, now reinforced with 10,000 Dornishmen, north to face Robert. Of the King's Guard, Lewin Martell and I would ride with the Prince. Before we left, the Prince confided in me that when he returned from this battle, there would be a great many changes in court. Despite my vows to the King, I confess I was excited. On the march to face Robert's army, we were sure we'd win. We had superior numbers. And we had Prince Rhaegar. His presence lifted the spirits of our men, and he looked every inch the king he was destined to become. But at the Trident, the gods played a cruel joke. Robert proved the Baratheon words as his army smashed through our lines. Luan Martell was killed. I fell in combat badly wounded, and could do nothing but watch as Robert's warhammer ended Rhaegar's glorious reign before it began and the kingdom that would never be washed away down the trident with his life blood. But Robert spared me, 
insisting his personal maester tend to my wounds, out of respect. But respect for what? A king's guard shouldn't survive one king, let alone two, and one who should have been. I swore an oath to House Targaryen, and I failed them. All that's left of their fire is a single ember halfway across the world, surrounded by darkness. If the gods were good, I would still be young in the fullness of strength. But whatever the cost, I will not let this ember go out. This time, I will not fail. Westeros has mighty rivers, but none of them compare to the Rhoyne. It is said that there is no stream or puddle in Western Essos but drains to Mother Rhoyne. No doubt an exaggeration. Until one sees the river, at its widest, a man in the center can't see a shore to either side. The greatest of Mother Rhoyne's children were the Rhoyner, a civilization as ancient and grand as old Guise. Fishers, traders, scholars, workers of wood, stone and metal. The Rhoyner raised their elegant cities from the headwaters of the Rhoyne down to her mouth, each lovelier than the last. For many centuries, the Rhoyner lived in relative peace. When invaders swept down from the hills, the Rhoyna, women and men, would don silver-scaled armor, fish-head helms, tall spears, and turtle-shell shields. If the enemy did not laugh themselves away, it was said that Mother Rhoyne would whisper the enemy's secrets to her children, and the Rhoynish wizards could raise watery walls to drown their foes. Whatever magic the Rhoyna may have had, it wasn't enough. When Valyrian colonists first arrived, the Rhoyna embraced them, for all men were welcome to share the bounty of Mother Rhoyne. Perhaps a water people should have been more cautious of strangers who exalted fire and blood. Legend has it that one day the Valyrians netted and butchered one of the giant turtles the Rhoyna held sacred. As a result, thousands were killed or enslaved, cities and towns were burned, drowned and rebuilt. In these wars, the Valerians emerged as victorious more often than not. The princes of the Rhoyne cities, fiercely proud of their independence, fought alone, whilst the Valerian colonies aided one another. Eventually, the Rhoyne princes ceased their squabbling and united behind Prince Garen, who led the largest army Essos had ever seen against a hundred thousand Valerian colonists, a hundred war elephants, and three dragon lords. Thousands burned, but thousands more sheltered in the shallows of the river, whilst the Rhoynish wizards raised enormous water spouts against the foe's dragons. Rhoynish archers brought down two of the dragons, whilst the third fled, wounded. And thereafter, the Rhoyna named Garen the Great. But Mother Valeria proved just as caring as Mother Rhoyne. When Garen the Great marched his army against Valantis, 300 Valyrian dragons descended from the sky. Tens of thousands burned whilst others rushed into the river, but the fires burned so hot that the water boiled and turned to steam. Garen the Great was captured alive and made to watch as Valyrians butchered every last man, so many that their blood turned the great harbor of Valantis red as far as the eye could see. Then they forced Garen to watch as they marched on his own city and enslaved all the women and children his army had left behind. The singers claim that Prince Garen called out Mother Rhoyne to curse the Valyrians, and she in turn flooded the city with foul waters and a damp fog that caused the skin of the Valyrians to harden and crack, and thus was born Greyscale. Fearing a similar fate, another Rhoynish ruler, Princess Nymeria, led her own people into every ship, skiff and raft they had, and fled Essos. Eventually, after much hardship, they landed in sun-swept and bone-dry dawn. But we all know that tale. Now Valyria has followed the Rhoyna out of this world, and her daughters have grown into free cities, wealthy and powerful and proud. Still, Mother Rhoyne flows on, past ancient ruins and bustling harbors, sweeping all man's kingdoms to the sea. Few afflictions are more feared than Grayscale, and far past the point of reason. A legend calls it Prince Garin's curse, after an ancient eastern prince whom the Valyrians hung in a cage and forced to watch the immolation of his city and people. As his city burned under dragon flame, 
this prince called on his god for vengeance, and a thick fog of foul humors rose from the ruin to smother the Valyrians with grayscale. But if diseases could be called down by the vengeful, we'd have no health in the world. More likely the disease predates the Valyrians entirely, confined to some remote region of Essos, and only spread throughout the world once the Valyrians linked the continent with roads and dragons. The disease begins as a rash. The afflicted flesh stiffens, calcifies, and cracks, and assumes the disease's nominal hue. Victims are graciously spared pain, as the disease dulls sensation in the infected limbs. But the disease is insidious, and slowly it creeps over the skin and into the organs. Once the infection reaches the brain, feral madness replaces humanity, and the transformation to a stone man is complete. There is no consensus on treatment. Some maesters advocate mustard poultices, vinegar rinses, and scalding hot baths. Others claim only three cures, axe, sword, and cleaver. Hacking off afflicted parts does sometimes stop the spread of the disease, but not always. Many a man has sacrificed an arm or foot only to find the other going gray. Those who have been miraculously cured of grayscale are few, and usually were subjected to so many treatments that isolating the responsible cure is impossible. Besides, few maesters, priests, or healers have the courage for such experiments as would prove a cure. Grayscale is highly contagious, being known to spread from even the slightest contact with an infected person. Hence the current occupation of Valeria by the stone men, exiled from their homelands at the first sign of the disease. What they do there, with their final months or even years, for Grayscale is a slow killer. No one knows. No one wants to find out. Before the Seven Kingdoms, before the Iron Throne, there was Dorne. Twelve thousand years ago, the first men crossed the land bridge from Essos to here. Of course, they were men, so they soon broke it. Then, while their cousins to the north built kingdoms, the Dornish squabbled over land, water, and wives. For centuries. Until Nymeria. A warrior princess in Essos, she led a fleet of 10,000 ships across the narrow sea to Dorne. Almost all of the petty lords made it clear that she wasn't welcome. All but one, Morse of House Martel. He saw in her a strength to match any man, including his rivals. After she accepted his marriage offer, she set fire to her ships. For 50 leagues, the coast was bright as day, and in the burning light, Princess Nymeria named Morse Martel the Prince of Dorne, in the style of her people. Dorne would be her home, or her grave. For many years, Nymeria and Morse waged war against all rivals, the Jordanes, Blackmonts, Corgiles, and even the mighty House Ironwood. They sent no fewer than six self-styled kings to the wall in golden chains. After Morse fell in battle, Nymeria took command of his armies and united Dorne. In two years, she ruled for 27 more, and though she married again, those husbands were little more than counselors and consorts. Dorne was Nymeria, and Nymeria was Dorne. She survived a dozen attempts on her life, put down two rebellions, and threw back two invasions. And when at last she died, her eldest child succeeded her, her daughter, not her son. And Dorne followed her because Nymeria had proven that women were equal to men, if not better. Centuries later, Aegon Targaryen sought to unite Westeros as Nymeria had Dorne, the other six kingdoms fell quickly before his dragons and ambition. When his sister wife, Rhaenys, flew her dragon south and demanded our surrender as well, Princess Meria Martel warned, I will not fight you, nor will I kneel to you. Dorne has no king. Tell your brother that. Rhaenys threatened that the next time the Targaryens would come with fire and blood. Meria replied, You may burn us, my lady. But you will not bend us, break us, or make us bow. 
This is Dorn. You are not wanted here. Return at your peril. Rhaenys did, and she died. Her dragon died. All her soldiers died. Eventually, her brother, the Conqueror, conceded that what Nymeria had done, he could not undo. Generations later, another foolish Targaryen invaded Dorn. He died as well. Eventually, we did join the Seven Kingdoms, but when we wanted, and on our terms. If dragons could not conquer us, why should we fear lions? Unbowed, unbent, unbroken. The words of House Martell, the words of Dorn. Men may forget, but women always remember. When we were divided, Nymeria united us. When we were invaded, Meria defended us. Now Dorn has been humiliated, its prince murdered. Who will rise to avenge us? People love blood when it's not their own. But tavern brawls are boring, and wars never have good seating. Thus, the famed fighting pits of Marine opened shortly after the city's own founding. And I heard that originally the combats were a blood sacrifice to the gods of Geese, the empire that founded Marine. Some still believe they are, but the Giscari Empire died a long time ago and their gods went with them. Yet the pits remained open, filling the city's purse with gold from the ends of the earth. I suppose the fighting pits are a blood sacrifice after all. Only the gods changed. In the pits, slaves fought each other to the death for fame and glory and gold for their masters. A lot of gold. Enough for the masters to invest in rigorous training. Slaves were taught to fight like Dothraki screamers, bearded priests of Norbos, iron-born reavers, Westerosi knights, Kohoric hunters, and Lysine pirates. Whatever would excite a crowd. After all, everyone wants to know who is the best. And, of course, who isn't for the crowds don't come only to see men fight well. I've seen the masters release tigers, lions, and other exotic beasts into the arena to chase less costly slaves, barely trained, if at all. A whore once told me of an amusement in one of the less prestigious pits. One boy was rolled in honey, one in blood, and one in rotting fish. And then a bear was unleashed, and the crowd wagered on which boy the bear would eat first. I never heard who won. Then again, it was obvious. The Masters. Did such stories worry me? Of course not. I could fight, and for a good fighter, life was luxurious. Thousands of people chanted his name when he stepped into the pits. He would eat the choicest meats, drink the finest wines, and sleep on exotic furs. Often not alone. Women would fling themselves at him or sneak into his chambers to wait for him after a fight. Foreign princesses, priestesses, and even the wives and wayward daughters of masters. He never had to fear punishment, for a great fighter could be worth 300,000 honors. Another wife was always cheaper. And when this renowned fighter finally fell, for all fighters will in time, his name would be inscribed unto the gates of fate among the other valiant dead. I remember once trying to count the names, but the gates opened before I finished, and another fight began. The great masters of Marine, as if calling themselves such could make them so. Thousands of years ago, during the height of the Giscari Empire, Marine was second only to old Guise in wealth and glory. A paradise by the sea, if one didn't mind the constant clinking of chains and cracking whips. Slaves built marine, and on their backs the city rested like a litter. Then came the dragons of Valyria. The masters of old Guise would not bow, so they burned. The Valyrians tore down their walls, burned their pyramids to ash, and sowed their fields with salt and skulls. An old slave woman once told me that the Valyrians intended to break the chains of the Giscari slaves, absorbing them into the Valyrian freehold where every man held a vote. But the great masters of Marine received their new overlords in the great temple, plying them with gold, wine, and all the wealth that slavery had brought them. 
and the Valerians instead took up the whip themselves. I do not believe it. As their empire expanded, the Valerians needed more and more bodies to feed their mines and colonies, when no wage could ever tempt a free man. The great masters merely accommodated their new customers, staying rich as the Giscari Empire crumbled. After the doom fell on Valeria, the great masters worried for their fortunes. By this time, the Valerians were their greatest providers and purchasers of slaves. Then the Dothraki horse lords swept out of the plains of Essos and proved to be as fond of slaving as the dragon lords before them. The great masters grew richer still. For the first time in its history, the great masters alone ruled Marine, and chaos ruled the rest of the world. The fighting pits swallowed men who in previous centuries would have filled the ranks of the Valyrian armies. Without these soldiers to maintain order, the wealthy had to buy their own, which the good masters of Astapor were more than willing to sell. If the buyer's nerves still needed calming, the wise masters of Yonkai could sell him further release. The great masters, the good masters, the wise masters. Yet none were so great, good or wise that they recognized our queen for what she was. Her ancestors had destroyed them, then become them. Perhaps they assumed she would bend as easily. But our queen does not bend. She breaks.